My lesson today is going to be presented in this, with this title. Confession is hard. Somebody may say, and you can see how this is directed toward Christians, but even in making a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we still make that good confession. But I'm thinking now about confession of sins. Please remember what we said this morning about the man after God's own heart, especially that part of that sermon that had to do with his confession of his sin. Some people will say, well, it's just hard to walk down the aisle with all those people looking at me or whatever. Have you ever noticed how we use terminology that a lot of people who are not involved with the Lord's church and the worship, they may not know what we're talking about. There are many churches that never offer any kind of invitation at the end of a sermon. Some churches of Christ have picked that up. And the question might be raised is, why do we offer an invitation? And what is that invitation? Well, you've gotten through studying. The sermon's designed to cause people to think about their lives. The truth is taught usually in such a way as it causes people outside of Christ to see they're outside of Christ, lost in their sins, and that they need to obey the gospel to some extent. Of course, you can't get all and every Bible subject in one sermon. But then, too, you have those sermons that are offered more to the members concerning them to be honest with themselves and God and examine their life. But then why do we offer an invitation for them? And we say, come forward, or some churches, I mean, Come down here and stand before the church and tell them what Christ has done for you. That's what that would mean. And in a number of Pentecostal groups, they'll start raising their hand and going up and down because they want you to, they want to be called upon to, as they would say, quote, testify for Christ, unquote, meaning. They won't tell you about some experience in their life. Well, there's a reason Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. And when we express to people at the end of a lesson designed to convert people to Christ or to motivate brethren if they have sins, to confess their sins privately, to confess their sins to God and pray for forgiveness, but if their sins have brought reproach publicly on the church, then to respond publicly to confess before the church the fact they have sinned and that they're repenting of those sins because mark this down, confession in the Bible of sins is evidence of repentance. Now, if you make a confession of the fact that you're a sinner or you've sinned, but there's no intention on your part to quit that sin, then that confession is useless. But when you have a sermon designed to make a person think about their spiritual state, whether they're outside of Christ, need to obey the gospel, or whether they're in Christ, and are they living faithful? Are they steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord? Or are there areas of their life they know they need to repent of because they're not faithful in those areas? Then you offer it for them to come down and to confess their sins and ask the brethren to pray with them and for them for the forgiveness of their sins. So we need to have people understanding what we do when we say come forward or please come down the aisle. We need sometimes to explain what we're doing because we get so used to speaking to ourselves, we understand it. But people who aren't exposed to what we do to be obedient to the Lord in our worship assemblies don't understand that a lot of times. Well, so some people think that walking the aisle, we'll call it, 
is difficult. But confessing sin, which evidence is true heartfelt repentance, when it's done right, now that's what's really hard. And I've approached this at times in preaching a lesson on what biblical repentance is. Emphasize this. Most difficult thing to fully do, as the Bible teaches, in becoming a Christian or at any time one needs to do it as a Christian is repentance. Because most people simply have the idea, I'm ashamed of myself, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But do they change their actions from then on? Now that would be the fruit of repentance, the reformed life. Repentance takes forth before that, but you don't know it except that one shows it by the fruit of repentance, which is the reformed life. You don't stay in that sin any longer. You show you have repented because you've confessed it, but it doesn't end there. You show it in the life you live. Confessing sin is necessarily individual and very personal, and that's one reason it begins to be difficult. We all sin or he sinned. That's not very difficult to say. The hard part is when I must say, I have sinned. Because sin is individual. Guilt before God is personal. And personal, from the heart, confession of sin is demanded. Now, that's the reason I had you remember what we said this morning about David. Listen to Psalm 51. Remembering what David did in his lust for Bathsheba. How far he was willing to go to cover up the fact she was pregnant. Led to the murder of her husband. Lies were told. But then as we noticed, when David was fully convicted of the fact I have sinned against God, I did it. Nobody else, I can't blame anybody. You know, if he'd been like some people would say, well, what was she doing over there on top of the roof, taking a bath where everybody could see her? That's not all my fault. I was her business to tend to, that's right, but the spotlight's on David. And here's what David wrote. And remember what we said about confessing sin is necessarily individual and very personal. David is very mindful, Psalm 51, of what has happened. And you can see he is heartbroken. His old stubborn will has collapsed. Have mercy upon me O God according to thy loving kindness according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions wash me throughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin now watch supplications this is prayer and supplications you want to know what supplications is? He's in a state of doing it right here. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, he's saying, you're right. I'm wrong. I can blame nobody but me. And I'm not trying to. Thou art God and just, righteous, and holy. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Can't get more personal than that. 
purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest, thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure and design. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Basically what he's saying there is when I get my life as it ought to be, then the rest of it falls in line. And never going to be what they ought to be. Now remember, he's not just saying that as a person who's an Israelite in his sin, but he's saying a person who's an Israelite and king with the responsibilities God gave me over this whole kingdom. So there is a load on his shoulders. I'm thankful to God that in his infinite wisdom and love for us that he's given us David's confession in Psalm 51 because it teaches me about what it is to pray to God, confess my sins and to offer supplications before God for my sins. So sin is individual or rather the confession of sin is individual. Sin of course is individual too. Guilt is personal. Personal confession of one's sins is demanding. And that's what we see in Psalm 51. But also confession of sin is very definite. As I said recently, this idea of somebody coming to confess before the church, if I have done anything, if, when you read Psalm 51, does it sound like David says, well, no, Father, if I've done these things. There's none of that there. If a person is at the state of where he's still saying or she's saying, well, if I've sinned, they're, they're not ready to make a confession. They haven't repented. That's easy, but it's not confession of sin. When a person is unsure whether he or she has sinned, they need to find out if they have. They need to be sure they have not, or they need to be sure they have. And until one knows and admits one's sin, then one can really make no genuine from the heart confession as we find recorded in Psalm 51. These if confessions are nothing more than a mockery of what God teaches on the matter, and they're a farce. Confession must say, I have sinned. There's no doubt in my mind about it. That's what I've done. Now, if there's one thing stands out, and there are a number of things stands out in Psalm 51, but if there's one thing that stands out is that David was definite. My sin is ever be for me. Another thing about confessing 
sin. It's specific. A confession of generally a sinful life is proper, but this is not the thing under consideration. Confession admits a particular sin, even as you can see it in Psalm 51. David referred to this evil and blood guiltiness. True confession is, I've been a talebearer. I've lied. Mown down the line. I've been a troublemaker. I've been contentious. I haven't for given somebody who did confess their sins. Now, I've been in church for a long time and I preach for a long time. And I never remember anybody and I've never heard of anybody. Surely somewhere there is where somebody came forward and said, I am a covetous person. I'm a fornicator. Now, I have come across those that have done that. Confess fornication and adultery. But not that often. But do you see the specificity in Psalm 51? Now, if that's not what that's teaching, then tell me what it does teach. It's hard, it's so hard to make the kind of confession we're studying about in the Bible. There are few who will do it. Of course, often sin is renamed. It's renamed. The crime against God in our own minds is reduced now, you know, it's a common practice in the practice of law and the land, prosecutors and defense attorneys. Uh, it may be something like this. The criminal is allowed to admit a misdemeanor rather than the felony he actually committed. I guess people get the idea you can do that as Christians, and God says, that's just wonderful. At least we got him that far. But you don't see that in the Bible concerning confession. In other words, in God's court, that's not going to work. You cannot confess hurting someone's feelings when you've outright slandered the person. Now, if you don't... <laughs> If you don't think brethren can slander one another, you probably don't have too much to worry about getting to heaven anyway because you're not responsible enough for much of anything. Brethren will slander one another right and left, and they've done so. And not a few elders and preachers. Been there and heard that, had it practiced on me. Now, what's the greatest example of it? Jesus Christ. And he said, beware when all men shall speak well of you. Trying to vaccinate them against thinking we can only operate when everybody thinks we're the greatest servants of God on earth. Not so. Over and over again, he said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They persecute me, they're going to persecute you. So part of getting a person ready to obey the gospel and be godly is to be ready to sacrifice. But we're talking about Christians who should know better because their name says of Christ and Christ never slandered anybody. Attacking people's character. I say preachers have done that because if you get into controversial areas where you're exposing false doctrine, and the person cannot, that's teaching it, refute you, I promise you he will attack you personally. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He will attack you personally. 
How does that work? Well, think of what the Jews did who wouldn't accept Christ. He works a miracle. He did it by the power of Beelzebub. It's all there as to how people operate who are great religious people. But being religious is not enough. Being a member of the church is not enough. Holy living is required. That's faithfulness. And we all have to work at it. So accidentally misrepresenting the facts or exaggerating doesn't take the place of outright telling a falsehood about somebody. That is lying about somebody. Confession means dealing with the specific sin. Confession addresses the one who has been sinned against. Now in Matthew 18, you have the instruction of how God expects individual Christians to deal with matters when nobody else knows about it but the one who sinned against one. So the one that sinned or the one who was sinned against. And that's where God wants it ended. God and those two are the only ones that know about it. And then, of course, that person is to go to the one that did the sinning. Or if the sinner has realized, I did that and I was wrong, that person is expected to go to the one he sinned against. Either way, vice versa. And set it right there and it goes no further. But if the sinner being approached by the one sinned against will not repent, then the one sinned against take two or three brethren with him. That every word may be established in the witness's mouth. And if that won't work, it's to be put before the whole church what the matter is. And if that won't work, then that person is to be withdrawn from for failure of repentance. Which means they wouldn't confess the fact they had sinned against somebody else. I've seen situations, been involved with them, where somebody would come to the elders and begin to talk about somebody that sinned against them. Well, elders can't do anything about that on their own as elders except to teach the truth to that person who's been sinned against and tell them to go back to Matthew 18 and go to that one and deal one on one and follow the Lord's pattern for dealing with it and bringing that person to repentance and therefore confession of sins. And so if elders are what they ought to be, they're going to say, have you done that? No, do it. That's all they can do. So confession names sins and individual sins ought to be taken care of as personally and individually as they can and where really the idea would be nobody else in the church even find out about it. Problem is, people will talk about it to everybody else rather than deal with the matter. When I moved to a place one time, I was told in visiting with the elders and asking questions before I ever accepted the work, they said, we've had a problem here and we've dealt with it as best we could in view of the, what's come down to us so we could. And he mentioned that we had a problem that where the preacher's wife got involved in, with other women and they were talking about a certain situation. They wouldn't even tell me who was what and who specifically was involved. And we could never get to the bottom of the story because nobody would come forward even though we told them that's what they need to do. We can't act without the facts. But it didn't happen. But after I'd been there nearly a year, the rumor of this one deacon having an affair with another deacon's sister-in-law became obvious for everybody. Because they simply ran off the week before a gospel meeting. We're not talking about people in their 20s. We're talking to a man who at that time was in his late 50s. And I suppose she was 40s. 
which really put things in gear. <laughs> and to show you how awful things can be, I mentioned to you, I was testifying at a court case here a while back, and the example of one of my sermons, well, this is that court case. In trying to show them why we put before the church what happened, They wanted to read Matthew 18 covering these scriptures in the courtroom. Now, mind you, this man had been a deacon in the church for years. He'd been active in the church in the time before all this came to light. He was as active and working around the church building as anybody could be. His wife was too. And you know in that courtroom, to show you how the warped mind is, when they wanted to read from the scriptures because when they asked him what he thought, the one lawyer protested and said, let him read from the scriptures himself and explain what he thinks it means. That was his lawyer. Well, all right, they didn't have a King James Version in the court. And the man, guilty of long-term adultery <laughs> had to have a King James Version before he would read from it. Is there any wonder that the Lord's church can get in the messes certain brethren put it in? They stopped the court proceedings, searched out through the whole courthouse till they found a King James Version that he could read from. I sit there in utter amazement. So you see, some people, to cover up a sin, can have their being completely corrupted. Now, another thing, confession addresses the one who's been sinned against. Have you ever said something about somebody and later find out it's false, what'd you do about it? Got rather quiet. Maybe nobody heard that. Or did you go to the person and say, I shouldn't have done that? Confession takes different forms and just coming down the aisle and making confession. I'm not saying that on certain matters you have to be specific on every little thing. Because when you come forward, you confess at least enough so they know, in general, what's going on. David didn't name Bathsheba in Psalm 51. He didn't have to. The point is, is that you, me, when we repent, we're repenting of sin or sins. It's very personal. They were committed against God. We stand condemned before Him when it involved other people. Then we go to them, they're our brethren. We're to love as brethren. I was prayed just earlier how much we are to love our brethren. So this business of confession takes into account how we deal with things. What we say. The words we choose. When we later on went to visit with this fellow... There were two more couples, and Jody and I. Supposedly, he was trying to come back, and his wife worked with him after 30-something years of marriage, by the way. And she was supposedly trying to let him come back, and she would forgive him. Now, that worked about like a lead balloon floating. But when we went to talk to him, encouraging him to repent, And he, he didn't try to cover up the fact he was an adulterer and he's long-term adultery. Not at all. Didn't try to cover it up at all. But when we sat down in this living room, she came in and sat down and greeted us. Then he came in later, sat down. And when we started talking, well, I think I started, but we all told him that we're there because we loved him, want to see things straight, hope this all works out, all this. And when we started dealing with him, the first thing he did was, was jump on the elders because they hadn't done this then. And I just simply stopped it right there. And I've had occasion to have to do that other times. I said, 
The elders may be the worst people on earth, but we're talking about you and your sins personally. That's what we're here to iron out. If there are other sins in other people's lives, then we can deal with that. But we're here because we love you and want to see you right. He just sort of swelled up. Somebody said I should write a book about these things because there's so many different things. I, I, w I wouldn't want everybody to read about that. <laughs> but now you think that's terrible in the church. Yeah, it is. Remember what we said about most of those letters written in the New Testament? What do you get out of reading 1 Corinthians? That everybody is living perfectly like the Lord said Christians ought to live? They were all written because there were problems. And in dealing with those problems, God revealed the truth. We talk a good show about speaking boldly and plainly and speaking as oracles of God. And not being frank and candid in our speak, speech. But I don't know when it comes to confessing sins that we've given the thought to it we ought to. And I'm not just talking about those who have to make a public confession of sin and what they say. I'm talking about daily in your individual lives as you appear before God. You have to come to this conclusion as David did in Psalm 51 to where you say that before God. You're brought to that kind of, as I've said all along, true repentance is the actual breaking down of the old stubborn rebellious will of man. That caused David to say what he said right here and be a lesson for all of us. These are just the rudiments. Confession of sin anticipates a plea for forgiveness. I think we all understand that. I probably don't need to spend any more time on that than, or less time on that than other things. Does the Bible teach us anything about that in the New Testament? James, you know, we say is a very practical book. The first lectureship at Fish Hatchery for this year, there'll be two others, is on the book of James. Gets right down to where we live in everyday conduct. In James 5, verse 16, plainly stated, confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another. That ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's no dodging the impact of that. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another. You know one thing it does when you do this? Keeps you humble. Keeps you contrite. I've seen some people say, well, if I admit I sinned, people will think highly of me. Well, I think pretty highly of David. And one reason I think pretty highly of David, a man after God's own heart, is because of these things about his confession. You also remember have in uh, 1 John chapter 1. We've mentioned it several times. Verse number 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word's not in us. Well, you take both of these passages together, James 5, 15, 1 John 1, 9, it becomes obvious then. There's a time and place for each one of us to confess our sins one to another. I have no problem, and I don't think it violates the Scriptures at all, that we're still doing, in other words, what the Lord authorized us to do, Colossians 3, 17. When people know they have something in their life they're fighting against and tussling with, for them to make it down before the church and let people know I'm fighting this fight. Pray for me, please. There's times people have met with the elder and said, this is a problem I'm dealing with right now. I don't know what to do about it. 
Help me on that. Every place I've preached, there's been things happen like that as a preacher being drawn into it many times. We need that kind of disposition of mind before we can be what God said of David, a man after God's own heart. That's the reason I said this lesson stands on its own, but it also stands connected with this one this morning. Confession is hard. But I tell you this, if you really want to become a Christian and if you really want to be faithful, then you'll do it just like David did. That's just the way it works. Because that shows forth the disposition of the heart that all godly people have and it's the disposition that is cultivated and built upon. Are you a Christian? As the New Testament defines and uses the word Christian, a member of the Lord's church, because you've obeyed the gospel. You know, some places, if you stood up publicly and confessed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That could get you in big trouble. We don't see that happening over here now, but there may be, you may be surprised on certain college campuses, certain workplaces. Just to emphatically state, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It can cause your workmates or your fellow students or professors or somebody to take a dim view of you. They may do various things in a form of persecution of you. But then there are those sins privately done. Are we keeping our hearts so attuned to God with a tender conscience that we will even confess our personal sins not only to us and God. And in the home, if daddy treats mama a wrong way and mama treats daddy a wrong way and parents treat children a wrong way and children te treat parents a wrong way, why well, one of the best places in the world to learn about repentance is in the home. I think it's a part of rearing a child, training them up the way she should go in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How could you train children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and not teach them about repentance that produces confession of sin? How could you? Any more than teaching them about confessing Christ to be the Son of God. These are things we don't give a lot of thought to, and I'm persuaded we should, to draw us closer to God. And we're taught to draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. David is one of the best examples. I can think of that very thing happening. And when you read Psalm 51, you see it. David is drawing nigh to God. Cleanse me. Wash me whiter than smoke, snow. Make me to know thy salvation. That's drawing nigh to God. And we in the church above all, in growing in Christ, becoming more like him, ought to cultivate that disposition. And there ought to be times in our own private daily devotions that we pour out our heart. Surely we don't think that we get through all these days and we never make a slip or always our thoughts are just exactly right. You labor that way. You work that way. But you, you will slip. Even when you don't want to slip. Work hard not at slipping. You do all you can to know the truth and live it. You're a human being, and you will slip. Therefore, there must be this humble attitude that says, I have sinned and against thee, and thee only have I sinned, and my sins are ever before me. Which simply means, I know as a human being, in and of myself or other humans, I can't get to heaven. It must be on thy grace and mercy and love and my compliance with thy will. So if you need to obey the gospel this afternoon or you need to repent and evidence it by confession of sins, I hope that you will do so as this song encourages you as I hope the sermon has.
to respond to the great invitation of our loving Savior while we stand and while we sing.